Um. Hello, beautiful souls. I am Valeria Maritza at Healing Through You. I am an infinite being of light, and so are you. Ancestral work. What does it mean? Where do you go to get help? Where do you go to find out more about what this means, how it works? How, how does that actually help us in today's life? How does it affect us when we're carrying ancestral wounds or patterns in today's life? Does it actually even mean anything or is this just some type of woo-woo stuff that's going around the internet? Well, if you have ever wondered about this, then this is the episode for you. I encourage you to sit here, meet my new guest, Ben, and he's going to tell us all about ancestral work, how it fits into today's life, how it can help you release deep wounds that perhaps None of the other modalities have helped you up until now. So sit back, relax, and join us. Welcome, Benjamin Stimson. I'm so happy to have you here in my podcast. How are you today? I'm doing wonderful. I've got a large cup of tea and it's raining outside, so it's just my type of vibe. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's kind of hot over here. I just put the air conditioning. <laughs> again in September. <laughs> so Ben, let's get right to it. Um, tell us a little bit about how your life was before you started to um, get your own healing and what brought you to where you are right now. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really been a 20 year long thing. Um, I currently live just outside of Toronto. I'm about two and a half hours outside of Toronto in Ontario here. But um, I'm originally from North Wales in the United Kingdom. I came over to Canada when I was about eight years old, and that caused a lot of issues for me. Um, culture shock was a big thing for me. I was bullied. I sounded different. I also had a neurological condition, um, which I needed some assistance with in the UK. Absolutely no problem. was receiving just what I needed. And then in Canada, nothing. So it, it caused a great deal of issue for me, and I, I became a very angry, angry person. And all throughout my teenagehood, I was a very angry individual. So one of the ways that I coped with that was through spirituality and through folklore and through fairy tales and storytelling. And I really connected in with that because it reminded me of my culture. It reminded me, me of my home. Um, all of the media that I grew up with was very much based on, you know, ancient paganism and goddesses and King Arthur and, and all of those, right? And uh, they're just a natural, magical part of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the community. So starting to go into my 20s, I went off to university and I knew that I wasn't in the right stream. It wasn't in the right place for me. And in 2010, I had a big breakdown, basically. I came, I was in my final year of my, my studies. I was studying social work. And, um, and I just knew I just didn't want to do it. So I ended up dropping out of university and um, didn't finish my BA, ended up going and, and working with my parents actually for about five years. And so I was really in this rut in my life of I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know who I was really. And um, a series of what I, I call weird coincidences happened. And in 2014, I decided, you know, I, I was sick of, of just going through emotions um, I had lost a lot of friends because of dropping out. I didn't have a lot of social connections. And so I ended up deciding, okay, I've got a lot of money in my bank account because I don't have anything to spend it on. Um, I'm going to open up a vending company. So I started a little vending company. I started going to the local psychic fair circuit up here in Ontario, started going to festivals and events. So I opened up a, a flea market booth. I went from nothing to suddenly being surrounded by all these people. And it was, um, you know, I wish I could say that it was like a, a awakening. It was really the kernel that was leading me down a road to weirder things. So I met a, a pagan spirituality group um, through this process. And I started working with them. I ended up going to the, the, the campground that they used for a lot of their events, which was only half an hour from where I was living. I had no idea that, that this existed. Um, and it was the community that I needed at that time. What it was exploring was that beginning of the hero's journey. So Joseph Campbell's monomyth, the hero's journey, going from inexperience and, and let down and, and, and the call to adventure 
going through that whole cycle into a sense of healing again. And it was just what I needed. And through that, I started interacting with people, meeting people, and each of those people kind of brought me into my future and to where I am now. The weirdest set of coincidences, and it was always coincidences surrounding some of these people, um, was that I would figure out that some of these people entering my life are people I had known before, or that they were they were connected to each other in ways that they didn't even understand. Um, the weirdest one was the spirituality group that I was working with had a maypole um, that they replaced. And this maypole so happened to have been sit sitting in the classroom that I was taking some spirituality courses through. And the two people who owned the maypole didn't know each other. It had kind of worked its way around Ontario for 10 years until it landed with Tiffany. No, it's I incredible. Well, <laughs> so I brought those two together. I know it was the weirdest thing. So um, the the spirituality group they'd been running for about twenty years. The maple they used was like fifteen years earlier, and then they replaced it with something else. But they gifted it around the community, and it ended up um, going to a psychotherapist that I had met at one of these psychic fairs um, around the same time that I had met these spiritual the spirituality group. And uh, and I would make the decision. I had this weird experience. And this is probably the story I was telling you on, on Facebook. I had this weird experience when I met her. She said, oh, you know, I have these classes coming up. And they were um, a series of 10 courses. They would be eight weeks every single Tuesday or every single Thursday. And they were on personal development. So one of them was on kind of uh, encountering the spirit within Another one was energy healing. Another one was um, on like chakras and things like that. Another one was on tarot. So really interesting kind of all, all stuff I loved, right? But I had that moment of, okay, something big is happening right now. She's telling me this right now. I've got a decision to make. Something feels big about this. But it was almost like, you know, when you're like, it's almost like, you know, the scene in The Wizard of Oz when they know somebody's behind the curtain and they just don't know who yet, so they peek behind the curtain. I felt like that. I felt like something big was happening just beyond the kind of the, the, the lens of reality. And it was big. So I had I, I decided then, okay, I'm gonna drive the hour and a half to this center. I lived an hour and a half north then. Um at, so every Tuesday and every Thursday for about a year, I was going back and forth. Um um, you know, not every week. Some weeks I only went on Tuesdays, some only on Thursdays, but it was a big commitment. It was a big commitment in time. It was a big commitment for um, gas money, right? And each of these little courses was, again, a big commitment. They were about $400 each, um, but I completed all 10. And halfway through that program, um, I suddenly had this unveiling of, okay, this is the direction you need to go. Because this program was connected to a psychotherapy school in Toronto, it's like the satellite campus. And um, I thought, well, I'll never be able to get into this program because I don't have a bachelor's. Until one of them said, oh, no, 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 we can do a prior learning assessment. Right. Oh. So I was able to then go with what I had and they went through my stuff and said, OK, yeah, you've got enough life experience and you've got enough training. Even if you don't have it on like officially, we can accept you. Two years later, they changed that. So I really got in there, really got in there. It was so just meant to be like everything. Be, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that, and that's really the story of the past 10 years for me. It's like it all was meant to be because I'm coming up now in a few months to the period where I started that little that little company. Um, so I'm like 10 years. In 10 years, I've gone from nothing all the way to, you know. <laughs> where you are now. Yeah, amazing. I really love that part of you finding the, you know, places like, okay, that's a coincidence. That's a coincidence, but we all know that not really coincidence that's how that's how we see it when we're not really um mm -hmm. looking into this like as a normal person you know out there oh it's a coincidence oh that happened but it's when we pay attention to those things that and we take action that we get shown the next coincidence Ooh. and the next place right absolutely i love yeah, that it becomes like muscle memory right the more you focus on it the more you're able to see it and I, I really clued into this throughout that year. So 2016, 
I really clued in that something that, that little coincidences could happen. And I think everybody has these experiences. And I certainly had these experiences before um, this, but I didn't recognize them in that way. Right? Everybody has these little weird moments. And the more I practiced it, the more I focused on it, the more it came out. So in 2017, I was still in this healing journey. I was still trying to rebuild my life. I was still trying to figure out what, what am I going to do? And over the span of that year, I had uh, seven individuals come back into my life. And each of them were somebody who I still had a lot of holdups with, or I needed some healing from, or through, or with, or they needed some healing. And it, we would meet in the most randomest of, of circumstances. The weirdest was my best friend, or one of my best friends from when I was in university so many years before. Um, it turned out, so I, I connected with him on Facebook again. I had no idea he was still in Canada. I thought he was down in California, right? Um, it turns out, like when we've connected fully again, if, like over the next year after that, um, it turned out that he was in, like his office was about five minutes drive from where I was living at that time. Um, he, because I was in a training program, I had to have my office to see clients. He was seeing the therapist whose office was right next door to mine in the same building, right? We were going to run into each other, even if we, you know, we, 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 we didn't know each other, right? So it's like, what is going on here you know yeah sorry yeah um what was i going to say um uh, when these people started coming into your space back mm -hmm. into your life and you said each one of them there was something that i was still holding on to mm -hmm. can you give us a little example with anyone uh, of, as to like what you realized that needed to happen what you were holding with that person mm -hmm. or something that you were able then to release and how did that happen how did you mm -hmm. release whatever it was that needed to happen i don't know if i'm making myself clear but... no you're making yourself perfectly clear um okay. so very good uh, one of the best examples is again with that best friend but i think another good example is um when i was about 14 15 i was online aol i was meeting people and that was my life right and i met this guy who was a little older than me he was 25 and uh he was chatting to me all the time we became friends and uh, and i started developing a crush on him and all that thing so i ended up going and meeting him in toronto like a few years later when i was preparing to go to university and we we met. We'd been talking this whole time. Still had a little crush on him, and uh, and I I went and uh, and he was just not the person I thought he was, and uh, he you know was very nice in that moment. And then you know afterwards, I came home. I texted him again. I said it was nice to see you. He said I don't want to ever talk to you again. I'm like, what is going on here, right? It's like seventeen year old, right? Just about to go to university or college, I should say did college before university um it was like why am i being rejected like what did i do all of that that whole cycle and um and i was really bitter about that for a long time because we were having like really intense online conversations i, I felt like i got to know him very well and uh and he was just a mess when i met him right so i i held on to that for a long time and, and that was a kernel inside of me of um, of that rejection syndrome, right? That idea that, oh, you know, I, I can't trust people, right? That was just another layer of that. And um, so when he came back into my life, he popped up through a friend, actually. And I was like, oh, interesting, okay. I'm going to message him, you know, just to say hello. So I messaged him, and he responded. And he was like, oh, hey, how are you? Like, it was just a normal conversation. He had no idea who I was. Even though all those years I'd held such a grudge against him and felt like he had been, you know, he was such an asshole. And he was an asshole, let's be honest here. And uh, and so we were just chatting back and forth. He had no idea. And uh, I said, um, you know, you and I know each other. He's like, do I? Do we? I said, yeah, you're blah, blah, blah. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, you know, many, many years ago, we had been chatting a lot. And I told him the story. And, and I was very much like, a, oh, you know, I'm going to really get you. I'm going to tell you exactly how I feel about this and all this, right? Like really chew him out. And he said, I have to stop you. And I have to say, 
I don't actually remember you because back then I was dealing with some serious drug issues and uh, and I really need you to understand that if I hurt you back then and I believe you, I believe you, um, I want to apologize, but I can't remember it. And I, I feel, I'm sorry that, I, that that happened to you. And in that moment, it was like holding on to him that whole time just became meaningless that whole i have this weird revenge scene and i think a lot of people do this right it was like walking down a, a dark alleyway and he's like inside of the alleyway and i'm fabulous you know dressed and all successful and all this and i look down on him and he's like can you help me no i'm not gonna help you look at me look it's horrible horrible part of it right that all just dissipated and in that moment, that compassion came up, and I actually I really did fully believe him, and um, and I had of course I'd heard some things from mutual friends of ours because he was a friend of he was a mutual friend of, of some of these people I met at this spiritual uh, group, and I was like, okay, so that sense of I I I I can let go now. I don't need to hold on to him, and I realized how much I was holding on to, how much of that wound was still perpetuating and still. You know, still, still traumatizing me all these years, and it was just like, just like that. That um, is incredible. That is such a powerful story because how many of us? I mean, we're all human. We all have that ego, right? Of like wanting to show them, wanting to show them whomever it is that hurt us, and it really is only hurting us. Like, like exactly. you just said, this guy had no idea. Had no, no idea. idea. He didn't even remember me. I'm like, wow, you know. <laughs> Yeah, wasting all that time yeah. on imagining. Yeah. Wow, yeah, that's so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's Thank really you. really personal. It was a powerful thing. And and at the end of that year, um, and we'll talk about the ancestors piece coming up. But um, that that year, I had been working with a priest in the Kumi, um, Santa Dia, um, and ancestor work is such a big important part of that tradition. Um, and he said, you know, all of these all these people coming back into your life, I suspect that your ancestors have something to do with it. And I actually got that confirmation that the message of that whole year from the ancestors was, don't live in the past because you don't belong there. And I was up until like all those years, I was living in the past because I didn't feel like I'd had a future. So of course I was living in the past. Really it's amazing as you're speaking i'm thinking back of my personal story and i'm thinking back of like wait a second this person just came into my life like a lot a couple of months ago that you know for many years but nothing has happened so maybe that obviously there must be something there for us for me to let go and mm -hmm. this other person also just came back he's like why are the people coming back into my life now i'm putting it together i'm wondering like how many people out there watching this right now are having this aha moment and like pausing like whoa like mm -hmm. what's going on like it's an invitation this is it feels like there's an invitation to dig deeper to actually investigate, okay, why is this person coming into my life right now? What is it that I'm holding on to, mm -hmm. connected to this person that I don't need to be holding on to, right? Yeah, it's I a powerful it. thing. And whenever I've worked with clients or, or talked with you know readers of my of my work, um, you know, it, hindsight is twenty twenty. We're we live in a temporal space where we're moving forward. You know, we're often able to look back and put the pieces together. And with these people that came back into my life, I was able to put the pieces together. But what was interesting was the more, like, the more they came through, these people, the more I became aware before they came that something was happening, that something was about to happen. I'd get anxious, I'd get butterflies for like a few, a, a week or two, I'd just be like anticipating something. And 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 that that feeling of kind of, Anticip like almost feeling the ripples from the future, right? Mm -hmm. Because of course we know the, the the past because we're moving forward in time. But time is a dimension, in the same way that you know um, height, width, and depth are dimensions. And so that sense of understanding, not even understanding that, just that felt sense that something is happening, that something is coming, that there's a ripple coming, something's in the future. Um, and so many ancient traditions tell us that that, that is how mm -hmm. reality works. One of my favorites is the concept in, uh, in Nordic um, Scandinavia 
of weird. And that's really where the word, the English word weird originates, W-Y-R-D. And the image of that is as an unfolding tapestry that's being woven with all these strands, right? So being able to, you know, understand the weft, like feeling the, the strand as it's being pulled into that weft um, becomes a visceral experience for me. And the more I do it, the more I'm conscious of it, the more I'm in tune, the more I'm able to get out of the way and let it happen or do something. And uh, and I, I, I feel like I've lived a much more fuller life because of that gut instinct, you know. That's amazing. Um, wow. I have like, there's just so much here that you have shared already that it's like making so many aha moments for, you know, mm. I'm, I'm sure everybody who's listening because I, I usually feel like what I feel, my audience is feeling. <laughs> right it's like i'm just putting the words in, in what you're thinking um so okay following your intuition your gut feeling and moving from place to place um i know what i was going to say and you were talking about feeling anxious or antsy or something like a week or two before this person was coming in um that's like your higher self right like telling you like you know, like your spirit or whatever is like not in your human body, letting you know, hey, this is coming. And then you're feeling it. Um, and then as in the human body, not knowing it, not having that clear connection, we don't know what it is. But like how many times have we felt antsy or anxious or like something's going on and we can't put our finger down and then it reveals itself to us, right, in, in our lives? Well, I, I, so I, I, I would take it a different way. I think that, yes, the higher self is involved, but I really do think that we are a, a lot more aware about the reality around us than we than our rational brains allow us to. The rational brain, and I know this as a psychotherapist, we filter out a lot of information that's coming to us because it doesn't make rational sense, it doesn't fit the narrative that we're socialized into, it doesn't fit the five senses model that we use to experience the world around us. So how I experience it more, and I think this is really important, everybody will experience these things differently. Uh, for me, it's understanding that when something is about to come, right, I get anxious, I get butterflies, I get antsy. For other people, they get other experiences. I've, I've talked to other people who they'll just start to notice patterns becoming stronger and stronger, right? It's that weird feeling of, you know, when you, when something uncanny has happened and it's like, you just suspect something like, it's like that the aha moment in a murder mystery when suddenly everything, the whole pattern just makes sense, right? And you just have that flash of inspiration. Sometimes that is experienced by people. So I think part of the process is becoming aware of in our in, in your own lives, your life and the life of your readers and listeners, um, you know, what is that experience been like for you already and latching onto it, right? So I know when I start to get anxious and I start to get butterflies in my stomach, I go through my list of, okay, is this because I'm hungry? Because this is, is it bad weather? Is it because I'm anxious about something I'm thinking about? Or is it something else? So, and, and sometimes it is a higher self coming in and being like, yeah, you need to watch this, right? But omens appear in other ways too. And so for me, my higher self often comes through omens. Um, and uh, and knowing the difference there between kind of knowing something's coming versus other information is coming through is 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 part of my own work. That's part of my own life. You know? <laughs> okay, well, thank you for yeah, you're right for all that clarification and you know making it tuning into your own way, the way that you're mm -hmm. feeling, the the way that you receive. Um, so tell us more about um how you got started into helping people with all of this knowledge with all of this healing that you have done on yourself how you know how is this working out like how how did you start doing it totally so i uh when i i got back into um doing that those self-development programs the whole point of them was to get back in with myself to understand what is my nature and my nature really is to help people. I'm really interested in working with people, really interested in helping and assisting and facilitating. 
Um, and, uh, and there's a big difference there between helping and facilitating, right? I was looking at ways to um, take the experience of all the social work education that I had and apply it to something in the future. And then this psychotherapy program came up and I thought, you know what, this could be, this could be it. This could be the way um, because I'm able to work with individuals. It's not a band-aid solution like social work is. And, you know, I'm not disrespecting social work here, but it can become really systematized very quickly. So I thought, okay, this is this feels good to me. So I pursued that. And I was able to bring in all of the things that I love in my life, the um, all of the narrative stuff, all of the, the self-healing um, piece, right? But also all of the spirituality piece and also all of the fandom stuff too, right? I'm a natural storyteller. I love stories. Story has been a big part of my life ever since I was a kid. And um, and so to be able to use story and help other people use their stories to help also became a big thing. Now, kind of shifting further, what I realized is that um, that whole experience, I, I graduated in 2019, I started my private practice, and then the pandemic hit suddenly all my clients left because I didn't have, they didn't have any money, right? So the government up here was allowing, like giving um, financial um, support to us during the pandemic. And I took advantage of that. And so I had a lot of time and I thought, you know, okay, I'm going to try and bridge together parts of my life. And so I, I wrote a book, ended up going through that journey of becoming a published author. And, um, and what I realized was after the pandemic, I suddenly had a private practice again. I was living part-time hours while also having a lot of good financial income there. So I decided to go back to school and finish my bachelor's. So I'd actually just completed a two-year kind of add-on to finish my bachelor's. And I went back and I, I did what I really love, which is history, religious studies, and, and, uh, and classical uh, medieval history. And suddenly all of these pieces are now all combined into one. I'm a pagan author. I write in metaphysics. I have a folklore book coming out. Um, I, and, and what allowed me to get more into the folklore aspect and look at story was training in narrative therapy and the therapy side and all of that piece. So it's my whole life, all the interconnections. So I, I think that answers your question. Can you remind me what your question was again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like how did you get started into helping people how did that work yeah you definitely did but um i love how that thread of you just moving forward and like this leads to the next and just following that and the key that i'm hearing here from what you've said is like i started doing the things that i enjoyed exactly i started exactly. studying the things that i like I, you know that course over there the, the 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 course that that lady was telling me it was all the things that were interesting to me all the things that were interesting to me exactly when i step into my authenticity and that's the big word of, of all of this authenticity um it not only invites other people by proxy to step into their authenticity but i'm also connecting with the people who can support me in, in my own authenticity the way that I niched my therapy services, so I mostly work with people of the queer community that I'm a member of, um, people who have expat or cultural um, um, uh, challenge issues, right? People who have immigrated, same with me. And also I work with a, a lot of people in the pagan and spiritual communities. People who want to come in and, 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 and do traditional therapy, while also talking about their relationship with their deities, with their saints, with their spirits, right? And and they're not going to feel like they can uh, are going to be pathologized, right? A lot of people have very spiritual, deep relationships with incarnate or discarnate beings, um, with their higher self, for example, right? Um, and they don't know how to even bring it up in a therapy space without sounding like they're crazy. Right? <laughs> so to be able to have a healthy space to do that um, has really opened things up for me. I think half of the people I work with are pagans or, or psychics or mediums or whatnot. And, um, and when we really just get down to it, it's all just about relationships. You know, it doesn't matter what those relationships are. And I've seen some incredible work. Um, through the therapy chair when people have that space and so again it's bringing all of these trends of my life together so that I can work with other people who are on a similar path you know I love that I love that because a lot of people um 
when they first come into or they come out, right? They come out with their spirituality or whatever it is they're coming out with. It's like now usually it's like I'm here all by myself. And usually your whole family, your whole bunch of friends is not right <laughs> along with you. So finding that um that group of people where you know they speak the same language, where you can be mm -hmm. seen, where you can be you, when you can be validated. Totally. Right, and like what a wonderful service that you bring into the world. So thank you, thank you for thank doing you. that. No, thank Just... you, thank you. That's, <laughs> that's very kind to say. And and it feels, I, I think one of the issues of the reason I dropped out so many years ago and got myself into that rut was because I knew that being a social worker was not for me. I knew friends who had gone in a year before and they were already burning out because they were going into a system that is set up to fail, set up for people to fail. Whereas when you work towards people moving into their authenticity, uh, it's a huge thing. I offer sliding scale because I want to make therapy affordable for people. And I've since seen some amazing work, especially what I really love is working with university students and college students and college age students, even if they're you know, out in the workforce or they're doing trades or whatnot, because that time in life is really a crucible. There's so much pressure placed on that age range of 18 to 22. Um, and, and so many of those individual, those kids, well, I don't want to say kids, many of those clients, the um, <laughs> they, they, they feel like they have a weight on their shoulders, the world on, on their shoulders. They have to make decisions and those decisions are going to have long lasting impacts, right? At least that's the narrative. So to be able to work with them, particularly around that age, because a lot of them are also exploring spirituality. They're, they've left the house for the first time. They're no longer under their parents' control. They might be outside of their physical communities where they've been locked in, um, in, in patterns that have been very unhealthy. Suddenly they're outside of that and they have the ability to start to explore themselves in a deeper way. And a lot of them do. Right. So I that age group particularly I really enjoy working with because there's so much potential there, right? Yeah, I love it. And and because, you know, kids now, I mean I'm still calling them kids because it just still feels <laughs> like, you know, I mean, gosh, you know, when we when I was twenty one, like really, what did I know? <laughs> um, but really like kids now are coming in, they're being born more aware, more awakened, you know, mm -hmm. and the younger they are, the more information they have uh, mm -hmm. about then the more connection they have that they continue to retain whereas before it's like you know kids will wake up I mean we're all we're all mm -hmm. connected but then it would just be like completely shut off because of what's going around but now it feels like the kids are are coming in with it and they're retaining that memory that knowing right yeah yeah and I I, I think you know, they, they're seeing how their older siblings or their even younger parents um, have, have have been dealing with the world. The, I mean, the teenagers now, it's an interesting phenomenon. The teenagers now, because they grew up after 9-11, because they grew up with so many wars going on, all this, they're very stoic. They, they are very, it's a very interesting generation. Um, and, you know, they, they're a lot more accepting of therapy because TikTok, because of social media, because of all of this, right? They're a lot more, I would say, interested in going deeper, even if they don't yet, from a developmental standpoint, have that understanding of their emotions fully, right? Because they're still growing up, right? But, um, but I think that's boding well for the future. I really do. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Okay, so now let's get really into this uh, ancestral healing. Yes. Um, Tell us about like what it is. How do you know someone needs that or how to go into that? Or how does someone, you know, who comes to you know that, hey, maybe this is what I want to explore? And how does it help us uh, heal or move on in mm -hmm. this lifetime when we do ancestral healing? Of course, definitely. So ancestor work is something that most cultures around the world have. So they do, you, you look in Asia, you look in South America particularly, you look in Caribbean, you look in, in Africa and, and, uh, and, and, you know, Eastern Europe, right? Ancestor work is there and has always been there. Um, and it makes sense that it does because these are the people that which those communities came from. We all come, we all have ancestors, right? So where the West particularly has gone awry is that we've separated 
continued relationship with the ancestors and the dead from mourning. So when we think of the dead, we often think of grief and mourning and sadness, and we don't want to go there. That's that Western paradigm of individualism, right? Ancestor work is an invitation to continue to have relationships with the dead and continue to, you know, have encounters with the dead, whether it be through, you know, um, going and performing rituals, going to the cemetery, whatever, or even just having that understanding that they're still there in some form and are accessible versus mourning, which is the dead are away, they're gone, they're never coming back. And what is that going to do for us? Well, that's going to make us fear death even more. Because if we believe that the dead are, you know, in off some off way, way place that we don't have access to, we don't have real access to them, suddenly they become non-human. And when you make something non-human, it is a lot easier to dismiss them, to not relate to them, and so on. And then particularly from my research, this is what the Western world has become. Look at the funeral industry. When somebody dies, the coroner comes, picks up the body, whisks it away, and then the next time you see it, it's backlit with beautiful makeup on in a suit and, you know, suddenly put into the ground. There's an unreality to it. And so I think that causes trauma for a lot of people too. I think we're also getting to a place where we understand generational trauma a lot more and a lot better, right? The world we live in now came from the, the actions of the past generation and the past generation before that, past generation before that. Just like the world we're building now, the kids that we were just talking to have come into the world because of stuff we did 10, 20, 30 years ago, right? So with ancestor work, what it is, is it's looking at, looking at that relationship building through a spiritual modality, as opposed to just um, a, a mental kind of intellectual modality. It's about immersing yourself in experiences and rituals and, and uh, events in order to build that connection. And that's really what ancestor work is all about, connection. Where the healing takes place is when we can connect with the dead and we build those relationships with the dead, we can bring them on board in dismantling or for us to understand the context that we live in now, right? A uh, very common example of this is people who are born into dysfunctional families where there is trauma. Right, whether it's abuse, whether it's systemic, ongoing things like alcoholism, workaholism, perfectionism, all of those things, right? Um, and that can cause not only disconnection, but also that trauma continues down the line because individuals born into those families will develop coping mechanisms to survive in those families. But then when they have their own children or when they're interacting with the, the general public, are going to be reactivated, in which case then the grandchildren are traumatized because they're coping with the coping mechanism of the trauma, right? So the ancestor healing there is, you know, getting those ancestors on board to help us understand those patterns and those mechanisms that are being perpetuated in us so that we can just either let go we can release ourselves of that weight that was never ours to begin with and to approach life now in a much more healthy way. Long, long, long diatribe there, but that's essentially what it is. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I um, just seen the, um, this study they did with rats mm -hmm. um, and they, they put in the little house mm -hmm. this uh, food and then the rat will go to get it. I think it was like a strawberry. Or a berry. And then whenever the mouse was getting close to it, it would shock it. Mm -hmm. And then that mouse had offspring. And then they put the, the offspring there without the shocker. And then the, the mice would not go to it. Exactly. It had this memory from the mother before they were even born that that was a bad thing. Like, mm -hmm. don't go to the berry, it's going to shock you. And the study went that it lasted for seven generations mm -hmm. of never having touched or being shocked, mm -hmm. but they were still afraid of that particular fruit. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, isn't that amazing? Like, it's it how is. this. No, it is. Yeah, go ahead. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just going to plug my uh, computer in there. Yeah, it, it is amazing, right? Um, and that, I mean, there's a lot of epigenetic studies around those sorts of things, particularly, for example, um, diabetes showing up in the Irish population and the Jewish population whose ancestors are directly linked to the Irish famine and the Holocaust. So Jewish members of North America, they, they did a study a few years ago um, of a population in New York and uh, the, the propensity for diabetes in these communities. And they saw that those whose ancestors were, uh, were either in the camps, Auschwitz or, or, or Birkenau or, or wherever in the Holocaust, or those whose ancestors had escaped Ireland during the famine, were more likely to have diabetes because the, the physical stresses on the bodies of their ancestors activated certain genetic markers that then were carried down through the generations, right? And, and we feel this. I mean, we talk about Gabor Maté, for example, a really, really excellent MD um, and, and writer on addictions. You can see that that happens in addictions, right? Um, you know, children born of, of individuals dealing with, with chemical addictions uh, specifically are more likely to develop addictions, partly because it's part of the community, like the family uh, pattern, but also there's a genetic component that's been activated there. So there's a huge big thing around epigenetics, exactly. Um, and I think those the other piece to that is the family patterns, right? So the individuals who, you know, in the Jewish community particularly, in dealing with the trauma of the Holocaust, Right, we see this with the um, with the Native American community or the African American community. Any marginalized community is going to deal with this too, right? Um, in dealing with the way that society is, is treating those marginalized populations, um, certain things will develop within families and communities that are very unhealthy because they are trauma responses to systemic issues, and then that becomes a self perpetuating issue over and over again. So it's a really interesting dynamic there. Where ancestral healing comes in is to understand those those social patterns, but also those perhaps genetic things, knowing the difference between them and then focusing on the things that, that you can control. So how do you help people uh, when they come in to you for help and then you see that ancestral healing or ancestral work is something that will really help the person in front of you how do like how does that actually work so what i would essentially do i mean if they haven't read my book i'm going to do a plug here in my book here yay <laughs> ancestral um, whispers um if i haven't read the book and they're just interested in, the, in ancestral work um I would first of all start by asking kind of what are we looking at gaining out of this, right? Because, you know, over the span of the pandemic, a lot of people were interested in ancestor work because death was everywhere. They were really curious about death. So understanding kind of what is the inclination there? What is What are we hoping to get out of it? For those people who are looking at ancestral healing because of trauma, or, and this is a classic example, they've done family research and they've come across a, a, a group in their family tree that they just don't feel like they can bond with. They're, they're ashamed of this family, of this aspect of the family. So we work through those in the same narrative style. What is it about these stories that are impacting them? Right? How is it connecting their individual identity and sense of identity and self within this individual, right? The only difference between that and traditional counseling is we actually bring the, um, or foster a connection with those individuals, or we foster a connection with healthy individuals in that family tree through a spiritual lens, through a spiritual practice, right? So we, we build an altar, perhaps. We start working with the dead in a regular way. We start having regular communication with the dead to see really how is it sitting, right? There's a lot, it's a lot more complex than that, but basically it's about fostering that communication. It's cut like couples counseling between the dead and you, right? But what I'm really interested in is how the individual is looking at themselves because of this new information, right? And then what is that in a spiritual sense? There are rituals that people can do and often do do when it comes to healing the ancestors. I'm not a proponent of that. It isn't our responsibility to heal the ancestors. 
how we heal the ancestors is by preventing the unhealthy stuff that's been passed down to us being perpetuated by being the best individuals that we can be in this life while we have the mantle of life, while we, we're holding the flag of life, um, so that when we pass the flag of life to the next generation, they'll be healthier because of it, right? Um, we become better ancestors in waiting because of that, because the other part of the belief around ancestor work is that they have a direct impact in our life. Part of building that relationship is so that we can go to our healthy ancestors and ask them, can you help me with this, right? And in order to do that, you need to build that re that relationship. You wouldn't go to your great grandma's house and sit in her parlor and demand a million dollars without getting to know her first, right? <laughs> so, and I think that that really gets in with that idea of community. When we look at spiritual traditions around the world, we see that ancestor work is often community work as well, right? During Dia de los Muertos, for example, right? The whole family. Just thinking exactly, of that was just coming right? in Dia de los Muertos, yeah. <laughs> is that is that one of the celebrations that you celebrate in your life? No, I believe it's mostly in Mexico. I'm from Chile, which is South oh. America. Um, so I found out about Dia de los Muertos when I immigrated here to the States and you know, through the community of meeting people from all over the world, which is you know amazing here. Mm -hmm. But uh yeah, that's how I found out about it. And I didn't know anything about it. And I was actually when I first heard about it, because they used the skulls, mm -hmm. um I was kind of like turned off. I felt like it was scary. Yeah. Like, oh, what are you doing? I mean, this is like, you know, teenage me and, you know, oh. young adult me. Uh, but as I actually started looking into the the culture, it's like, oh, like this is, is so much more than what I thought, you know, because I, I did come into the space with that fear of death that you right. were mentioning before, right? Like somebody dies and then like, that's that's it, right? Yes. And, and we're culturally conditioned to to see it that way, right? Um, but it, it never used to be that way. Really, that's only been the past 100 years in, in, in kind of our Western world, even extending out of, of the bounds, right? And, and that fear of death also, of course, is fear of our own death. What happens to us? Where do we go? Is this experience it, right? All of those big questions, you know? So wh what I love particularly about Dia de los Muertos or even like the Day of the Dead in other contexts, right, in like All Souls Day, is people going into the cemeteries, people going on, on that particular day, Halloween, another example, right, that day is devoted to the dead and inviting the dead back and interacting with the dead. And when it's in a community setting, it's, it becomes an expected thing, you know. When we die, we'll we'll be welcomed back next year. We'll be ha we'll have an altar set up. We'll I'll have, you know, the whole family will come together to remember us, and that can be insanely comforting, right? This is why all around the world we see this. It's it really what's happening in North America and, and Europe is a, a very strange thing. The majority of the rest of the world is doing this. Chinese um in the Chinese communities and like Asian communities generally, like. Uh, ancestor veneration is a big thing and it's a big thing because of the hierarchies that are set up in those in those cultures right when you die you know that you will go and join the ancestors and these ancestors are known to you because you have worshipped them or venerated them all your life right it's usually the kids who go and tend the shrine because you know mom is doing or dad is, is is cooking and there's other things to do other chores need to be done so you go and tend the shrine so you go and you like great grandmother, great grandmother, you know, uh, bless us, blah, blah, blah. You know who great grandmother is because you've been seeing her picture all your life, right? Yeah, yeah I love that. Yeah, so good. So good information here. I love it. Um, Tell us, uh, how can people get in touch with you? Yes, of course. So, um, you? best place to go is my website, benstimpson.com. Um, that has all of my stuff on it. it, has information about my books, about my services. Um, I have a podcast that I also do with other pagan authors. Um, so if people are part of that sphere, they can go and, and listen in some conversations. Um, and I also have some classes. I have a Patreon where I have loaded classes available as like a class archive. So for a, sol a small subscription, people can have access to all of those. Um, and uh, And yeah, that's where they can go and find me. Amazing. And I will put all of those links down in the description place. So um, you can, if you didn't have a pen and you missed out the website or anything, just go look under the description and you will find all of the information on how to get in touch with Ben. Show us your book again. 
because I think course, it was so like so fast. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, I love it. The, love uh, the, the cover book. design I love because it's the tree of life that has both fruits and the skulls, right? We understand that the dead are humans and were products of the tree of life just like we are, right? Um, and and we will eventually become one of those fruits. So I, I, I really, I love, I love the, uh, I just love the feel of it. Llewellyn did a really good job with the uh, with the uh, the front cover here. I love it. Amazing. Yeah. So um, before we go, is there something else that we didn't touch in? Something you want to share with the public? Something that you know maybe we didn't say or anything, and and you want to share with them now? Yeah, for sure. I in in keeping with this idea of healing, right? I found that. It be, my life got considerably easier because I was going with the flow of my life, right? Beforehand, I was really treading water. I was trying to go upstream. I was, it wasn't working for me. When I found that I got into my groove and I was flowing with the river, um, it, it became a lot easier. It's not perfect. Um, I can't control where that river is leading, but I, I do know that I'm going in the right direction. And because I'm going with the flow, I'm not fighting against it. Things are falling into place. So I would say that healing has been a huge part of reorienting me so that I'm going with the flow again. And that's been powerful for me. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your story. This was really powerful. I hope everybody has gotten a lot out of this conversation. There's so many aha moments in this, in this. <laughs> <laughs> it's exhausting i lived with it believe me it's exhausting <laughs> amazing all right well um thank you again for coming i appreciate all you do for the community and for sharing this in my podcast thank you thank you bye-bye bye, -bye. bye now. whoa what an amazing episode what did you get from this let me know in the comments what do you what was your high moment from this like what parts that connected to you i had so many aha moments interviewing ben here today it was amazing uh don't forget to subscribe like make a comment and share 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 so that more people that you feel can get a lot out of this podcast and the information that's coming through can get the information with that, I love you so much and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.